I love it how you see the character of the speaker in what he chooses to speak about. <laughs> a lot of times when questions are asked, even by men, they are full of intention, not just merely for inquiry. You remember hearing the phrase, that's a loaded question? <laughs> that's what that means. There was a lot of intention in what you just asked. As we have seen this weekend, the Lord uses questions in this way. He questions us intending to lead us in our thoughts, to behold something that he wants us to look at. He did say, come and let us reason together. And for the sensitive heart, this reasoning with God can be provoked by his interrogation. He provokes a self-examination. Remember David, he asked the Lord to search him. In Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. We're not disassociated with this. This is a reasoning together. We ask the Lord to search us, but we are involved with that ourselves, and he will disclose his findings to us. And these questions that he asks is one way that he will do this. Now, Brother Aaron's text this morning is from Mark 9, verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves, by the way? Jesus asked his disciples this. In this text, Jesus asks his disciples to examine themselves. He, choose, he chose words that were very pointed. He said, you were disputing. What were you disputing about? Just the fact that it was Jesus who asked them this question, it showed the foolishness of their disputation. You notice they held their peace when he asked that question. He was showing them that, first of all, they were not united. They were not in agreement. You think of a disputation, and it's something when one person or group exalts themselves above another. And that's not Christ-like. So in this question, what were you disputing? Jesus was showing his disciples that, number one, they weren't at unity with one another. But secondly, they weren't showing forth his nature either. They were at variance with Christ himself. What we can be dull to or blinded to in ourselves, the Lord can reveal to us with just a question. And by incorporating these questions, the Lord is helping us to reason in such a way that we'll come to the right conclusion. It's like with his question, he points us in the right direction. So that when we reason together with him based on this question, we'll come to the desired point that he wanted us to come to. Amen. Now sometimes we may have need of being redirected like the disciples did that day. It's like Jesus changed their course of thinking with that question. Other times we may have need of a confirmation. You think about Brother James's text yesterday, who do you say that I am? When Peter answered that, that was a confirmation of where he stood. The Lord confirmed him with that question. And he did ask a question. He didn't just say, now listen, you were out of line and you shouldn't have been disputing. He asked this question. They were to give an answer. They were to ponder their motives and then confess to Jesus, a confession. In other um, texts, this is an account. They were called upon that day to give an account of themselves. This is what we all have to do. There's a day coming, the judgment day, when we will give an account. And we can see that with these questions that Jesus asks, that the Lord gives us in Scripture, he is teaching us how to do that now. Jesus sure has a way of bringing things to light, bringing things out into the open. Well, of course he does. He is light. He's the light of the world. And In fact, <clears throat> no man really meets himself until he meets Jesus because you can't know yourself. You can't see yourself for, for what you're really made of until there's some light to see what's there. And the disciples certainly had that experience here in this account where they, not, not even their, what they thought was a private conversation was private. Now they had, they had seen Jesus read the thoughts of men before, but they didn't think about that when they were having this conversation. Things are always discovered and made observable in the, in the presence of Jesus. 
And that's, that is a mercy uh, to us. Now, Jesus doesn't do this like, a, like an undercover investigator. He's not extracting, you know, taking information and observing things and people to where people don't know, you know, that they, that they were in the presence of a detective, you know. It was not undercover. He does it so that he can bring it out into the open. That's why he, he makes these things known. It's not that, not that he needs to know. He doesn't need that any, there's no need that any man testify of man. He knows what's in man. That's right. See, he did, he, he, he did this at several uh, occasions where he said, he that's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. There must have been some astonished looks among that crowd. And they, they were probably thinking, well, I didn't, didn't, hadn't thought about it like that before. Well, Jesus made things known. He brought, brought things out into the open that really, when you, get, when you really get down to it, there wasn't that much difference between that woman and her accusers. But they didn't see it until Jesus made it known. And here's another example of Jesus making, these, making things known. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He didn't know. Now, Saul of Tarsus, was, he was serving God, not, not according to knowledge, not out of, according to knowledge he had. But he didn't know he was persecuting Jesus when he, when he was persecuting the church. It was, it, this was, he, Saul wasn't, it wasn't a vindictive type of aggression against the church. It was, he, he saw it as an affront against God. That's, that's why he was doing that. Then he, he realized he was actually persecuting the Son of God. He, but it, Jesus made that known to him. Remember that night that Jesus, the words of Jesus came true, and Peter heard that, that cock crow and turned and looked. Peter didn't know really what he was made of. He says, I will never, but he did. And Jesus made Peter to know Peter. And that's what happened here in this text. He made known. Now, this was a dispute. They, they disputed. What did you dispute Interesting choice of words, isn't it? It must have been a spirited conversation, and there must have been some strong opinions offered. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been called a dispute, right? It wasn't. It, he didn't call it a friendly conversation. He called it a dispute. They were disputing about these things. Now, just just consider that they had just failed earlier to cast the, the demon out of the little boy. They just failed, and now they're disputing who will be the greatest. They had just failed to understand when, what Jesus meant when he said, the Son of Man is going to be handed over and killed, crucified, raised the third day. And they said they, they didn't understand what he's saying, and they, they feared to ask him. But then they entertained this dispute about who's going to be the greatest. These things, that, that, that just doesn't quite add up. They, they'd also just recently now, all these things are recent, not just random events, they just recently had not understood why Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Oh, we didn't bring bread. Yeah. Didn't plan this trip very well. And yet now they're disputing who's, who will be the greatest. They, didn't, they, they weren't picking up on things. Jesus, in fact, had just been rebuked by Peter. So may it never be. And then Jesus turned the tables and rebuked him. That's when, when Jesus called him Satan. That had, that had just recently happened. Jesus had, in fact, just said, if any man would come after me, he's got to take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. And just shortly after that now, they're disputing who will be, who will be the greatest. It's not like they were, had run out of things to discuss. I mean, there were plenty of things they could have been talking about. They were with Jesus all the time. There were a lot of things that could have been Discussed like parables that they didn't yet understand. You know, they could have brought that up again. As a, now, here I've been I've been thinking about this, and here's here's some other things to consider about the seed and the sower and the and the treasure and the net and all these different parables that they 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 could have been discussing that, but they weren't. <clears throat> they could have discussed the the times where Jesus Jesus quieted their enemies, and they they durst not ask him any more questions. They could have been discussing those times where something Jesus did reminded them of something in the scriptures. They remembered the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. It's not like they were out of things to talk, to talk about. Now, we don't have very many details of this dispute, and I don't think it would be any advantage for us to have them anyways. The disciples did grow out of this dispute. So we, we don't know, we don't have to know any more details. They didn't, they didn't bring this dispute up again after Jesus ascended 
you know, on that hill, and the angel said, don't you know he'll come again? They didn't look at each other and say, now, about who's going to be the greatest. <laughs> they, they got over the dispute. <clears throat> See, there are some issues that just fall by the wayside as we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some, some questions really don't need to be answered. They just need to go away. We should give thanks that the Lord dealt with this issue like he did. You should, you should put yourself into, into this text and realize how many times has the Lord been merciful to you by in this same way? He didn't, he didn't rub their noses in this issue. He was, he was, uh, he was very gracious uh, with them. He, did, he also didn't let the problem lie around and just wait until it goes away. He did bring it up, but he didn't injure them with it. He didn't, he didn't answer them like he did the, uh, the blind guides in the whitewashed tombs. He, he, didn't ju- he didn't just hit them. He, yeah, what did you dispute? The, the question's so revealing. It was just, you know, when, when he asked, they, they held their peace. It would have been like that room where you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> they didn't want to answer. So he was, in this case, he was gently carrying those with young, as, as a shepherd does. He didn't break a bruised reed. He didn't quench a, a smoking flax. Now, there should be some things disputed. Jesus was not disputing all disputes. He was disputing that dispute. What did you dispute? Nehemiah contended with people, and he smoked them. He was, like, aggressive about the issue. Their, they, their children were speaking in half the language of Ashdod and half the language of the Jews. And some of the people had married foreign wives. And, it, and, and Nehemiah, he was, he was bothered by this because of, because of his godly demeanor. It wasn't just a personal vendetta that he had against the people. And he, he contended there are some things worth contending. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> John the Baptist pressed the issue about Herod having his brother's wife. It's not lawful. He pressed the issue. Maybe that was, that's what pushed Herod over, over, over the edge against John the Baptist. Jesus disputed with people who found fault with the disciples for plucking ears of, of corn as they walked through the field on a Sabbath day. Well, maybe, maybe we, we, there's obviously a disagreement about this, and maybe we should just not talk about it. Some issues are like that. But Jesus pressed the issue. He says, the, the man's not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath is made for man. Yeah. Yeah. He, he pressed the issue. James confronted people about showing favoritism in their assembly. Rich man comes in, gets a good seat. Poor man comes in, sit over there. That's an issue worth contending. You, that needs to be disputed. You can't let that lay. Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension with the Jews about that circumcision issue. They, they, th- when the truth is at stake, then you go to battle, but not over your personal issues. Saul disputed against the Greeks in the name of the Lord Jesus. That was, that was shortly after his conversion he, he disputed. Paul disputed in Athens his, when his soul was stirred in him and he saw the city wholly given over to idolatry. He, he, he disputed with them. See, when the servants of God dispute for the sake of the gospel, then the forces of heaven are with them. You go to dispute about your own greatness, you're on your own. Where you dispute for the souls of the strength, for the souls of the saints... Well, then, in that disputation, see, then the strength of the Lord is it'll undergird. It'll undergird you. But you go to bat for yourself, and you find out that you're by yourself. So Jesus was not making the, he's not trying to make the disciples into pacifists. There are, when there are, there are times that the souls of men are actually in the balance. And that's worth a dispute. There are times when the name of the Lord and the truth of the gospel is at stake, and then you should dispute. Amen. <clears throat> Paul said this to the Galatians. says that the, I didn't, I didn't uh, give place to them, no, not, for, not even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So there, there are disputes worth taking up. <clears throat> Here's an example of this. Are you going to destroy your brother with meat for whom Christ died? That was a dispute. He says, I'm, I'm not going to let this issue lay. You've got, you've got to be sensitive to the conscience of the brethren. You've got to be. 
Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? That sounded like a confrontation. It really does. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He was, he was disputing this direction that the Galatians were going to. Going. You go to court against one another? You know what? You should rather just take the wrong. You should just rather suffer the wrong rather than go to court with your brother and, and that before the unbelievers? You should have, you're, you're twice at fault now. But Jesus didn't force an answer to this question when he said, what did you dispute among yourselves, by the way? His intent was, was to grow them up, not to get an answer. It was to expose the issue and to, to nurture them along. <clears throat> now they were disputing who would be, who would be the greatest. I've, I've thought about this a lot and Without, that's like the only detail that we know about this conversation. We weren't given a, a, a dialogue about this conversation. Who would, who would be the greatest? Now, I don't think this was a childish argument. Okay, I, I guess this, this is my opinion, but I don't think that Peter said to John, I'm going to be better than you. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think it was... John saying, I'm going to be in charge, guys. Sorry. You're going to have to do what I say. I don't think that's what the, this dispute was, was all about. These are the men that Jesus chose to be with him out of the world. Okay, so we, we don't want to think, we, we don't want to think in derogatory terms about these men. I'm not going to get on to the disciples here. There are a lot of people who have been harder on the disciples than Jesus was. Woe unto them. And, and also, in their defense, they didn't harden their necks when Jesus asked the question. And they didn't ask Jesus to settle it. They, they dropped it. And that's what should have been done. I think that was the point of the question. It's for the issue to drop. I think that the apostles thought of Jesus and his kingdom and his, and his throne in terms of David's kingdom and Solomon's throne. I think that's the kind of... That, that's what... The, they, they had asked, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were currently under the oppression of the Romans. They were, there was other times like this in, the Jewish, in Jewish history. Uh, captivity in Babylon, captivity under the Philistines. There, there was, they were oppressed by the Midianites. There were times like this, and that, like, they were, like they were in now. So they were probably thinking in their, in their minds... Uh, of what you might call the, the glory days, you know, of David and Solomon, when, when all the, the kingdoms around them were being, uh, were being taxed and, and they were, you know, they were on top, so to speak. But now the, they, they had to ask Pilate concerning social issues. You know, they had to get permission. It's like a big brother state, you know. When are you going to restore the kingdom? So they were discussing things. It, it's, this, this wasn't like a, like a 12-year-old argument. Their expectations of Jesus' power and authority needed some direction. It needed redirected. His kingdom, my kingdom's not of this world, Jesus said. But it is a kingdom. And it is a, there is a throne. And there is power. And there will be great people. People put in great places in this kingdom. Now he's not going to make um, political power figures... Out of, out of these 12 men. He did not turn, you know, when uh, Herod, in, later in the book of Acts, he, um, an angel smote him, take, took his life because he gave not God the glory. Well, one of the apostles wasn't promoted up to that position because his kingdom's not of this world. They weren't made political. So it was their, ex their expectations needed, needed re redirected. They needed some guidance. And Jesus is the shepherd here. So he's, he's guiding them into, this is not... He didn't really answer the question. He, he asked it, and then he, and then he redirected. He redirected. Jesus did refuse to judge between those two brothers. That's right. that, that, that wasn't what the kingdom was like. That's not why he came. He said, I did not come to bring peace. Not in this world. He's the prince of peace between, in the presence of God. He makes peace between God and man. He didn't come to negotiate peace in family feuds. 
you know, like Solomon, pe people coming to Solomon all the time. We got, got this argument and this trouble and he said and she said and they did and all the time. That's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to be the kind of king like Solomon. He's greater, a greater than Solomon is, is here. You know, it, this issue, there's so many expectations that j just fall to the ground when it comes to when it comes to the Lord, Herod had this expectation. I want to see a miracle, kind of like, yeah. like, like going to a circus. You know, just wanted to see something that you don't see every day. Well, Herod didn't get to. His expectations were wrong. The rich young ruler, he had an expectation. He figured that rich man, young man, he probably got whatever he wanted in life. He was a rich young man. He came to Jesus and he thought, well, I, I need to add this to the portfolio. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He got everything else he wanted in life. His expectations were wrong. Those who ate the multiplied bread, they thought, you know, this is this would be a this would be a great addition to the economy. To have this man as, as king. Their expectations were wrong. People have tried to come to Jesus for the sake of their career. They'll be disappointed. People come to Jesus because they're parents and they need to they need some counseling about parenting they're going to be they're going to be disappointed you can't come to jesus as a, as a psychologist or as a financial planner the wrong expectations make it impossible to come to jesus <clears throat> those who seek power to confer the gift of the holy spirit they'll be turned away have no part nor lot in this matter there was another time that G their expectations were wrong. The disciples said, shall we call down heaven, uh, call down fire from heaven on these? And Jesus said, you don't know the manner of spirit that you're of. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save. Their expectations were wrong. What would they have done if Jesus said, sure, go ahead. Call down fire. Their, is, their expectations were, were wrong. In the very next chapter, after this question is asked, after they held their peace because they, they, got, they caught the ball, that this is not the right kind of conversation to have. After they caught the ball, then the very next chapter, James and John came with their mother and asked, we want you to give us whatever we ask. Well, Jesus gave people what they asked all the time. We, I want my sight. He got it. Now, when James and John asked this question, it says the ten, they were, they were displeased with this question. Now, we, we, now did, they, did they beat the ten to the, to, the, to the punch because they wanted to ask? Or were they displeased because they remembered the question that had just been asked? I, I don't know, but they were, they, were dis, they were displeased. Now, Jesus didn't answer this question like, like some people would today. Some people might answer this question like, nobody's going to be sitting at Jesus' right hand and left hand. You shouldn't be worried about that kind of thing. You shouldn't even be talking about rewards or power or anything. You should, you should serve God just because you're supposed to, because that's the right thing to do. You need to quit talking about promises and hope and glory and satisfaction and rewards. You just need to quit talking about that. Well, the problem is God's talking about it. The problem is that is an attempt at humility. God is a rewarder. And so I, I encourage you, as you're seeking after God, you ought to be thinking about what God does. He is a rewarder. And I think it's a liar who says that in serving God, you shouldn't think about rewards because God rewards. And this is not, this is not just like a, like a sideline issue or just a... Just, just a just kind of a theory that somebody has about God. This is what God has revealed about himself. He is a rewarder. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a judge. No, is it, you got to, to come to God, you've got to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He said to Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. And I think it's right for men to want what God is. Lay, we, are, we are invited and called to lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. Amen. 
and still men are discouraged from doing this. Jesus said, he, he that overcomes, he'll sit down with me in my throne. He that overcomes, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. That, that means you're going to be something significant in the world to come. God's going to give you something to do that you've been prepared to do. And it, it, it's a pillar. That doesn't mean that you're, you're going to become a, a structural piece. He's, talk, he, he's, he's talking about something that is significant. So you're going to be given a work that is, that, that's important and significant, a pillar, something that holds the structure up. I will give them power over the nations, he said, in, that, in the promise to them, those who overcome. So in light of all these things, now, now consider, he said, what did you dispute among yourselves, by the way? But he did promise these great things. So I want to reconcile these things together. The right hand and the left hand are seats that are prepared for someone. Jesus was saying, you just shouldn't be concerned about this issue right now. They are going to be, they are going to be given for, to someone. Someone's being prepared for these great places, and they're going to be given a great work to do. They're places of honor and greatness in the kingdom. There are people who are going to sit with him in his throne. There are people who are going to be told, be thou over ten cities. That sounds like a great work. He's making a kingdom of, of kings and priests, that, of the people who are, are able People who you can, people whom God can give power to without without any any danger of that power being abused. That's a kingdom of priests. Amen. There there will be people who have having been faithful over little, they'll be faithful over much. They're going to be given much to be faithful over. Here's what I'm getting at. I think that those who are great in the kingdom are not concerned about being great. Greatness seeketh not her own. There's a greatness in the kingdom of which Paul, speaking about Timothy, he said he, he naturally cares for the things which are Jesus Christ. That's greatness. See, there's a greatness in the kingdom that doesn't match up to the greatness of the world's standard. In fact, greatness in the kingdom is hated by this world. Vehemently hated to this day is hated. Did you know we're living in one of the bloodiest generations? It's almost like a lot of people think of bloody persecution as a thing of the past. It's anything but a thing of the past. The world hates kingdom greatness. It's always been imprisoned and killed and, and abused. To be, to be great in the kingdom is actually no earthly advantage. It could be a disadvantage. Just ask the prophets. They're, 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 they were mentioned about you know, sitting down in the kingdom with the prophets and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the prophets lived very painful lives. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. In due time you will be exalted. At, that is at the right time. God is going to exalt people, but not too early. He's going to exalt them at the right time, at, in due time. The Lord is never going to exalt too early. In fact, it would be to a person's ruin if they were exalted too early. You know, we, we don't give the car keys over too early. We don't give, see, you got it. There's a lot of things in life. Even as parents and children, you got to earn it, and you're not getting it too early. Jesus told his disciples <clears throat> that they would... They would sit down on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That sounds like a great work. But at this time, he said, what were you discussing? What were you disputing, by the way? See, actually, what the, the great work that they, that they were headed to, that they were slated for, was much greater than they could even understand at this time. Amen. It's not that Jesus was disputing greatness. He was disputing their concern about being great. Amen. You know, there's actually, <clears throat> there's nothing that will reveal quicker what a person is really made of by, w other than giving them power. Uh -huh. you, ever, you ever seen that in the workplace? Yeah. Somebody gets a pr promotion, a, whew, never knew they were like that. But now they have the power. Uh -huh. <laughs> and see, in, at, in due time, God, the Lord's going to exalt you yeah. in due time. 
thus judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it doesn't sound like, that doesn't sound like a servile appointment. <clears throat> there, was a, there will always be training times like Moses had in the backside of the desert that made him ready to go back to, to Egypt. And there was training times also for King David, uh, getting ready for the, the Goliath uh, confrontation. He had to kill a lion and kill a bear, and he, he, got, he got ready for, you know. And so, so now we're, we're, getting, we're getting ready. We need to be concerned with what God's given us now. What's in your hand now? Amen. That's what we should be discussing. What, what's in your hand now? <clears throat> Jesus told them, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't be, don't be concerned about greatness. God, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, humility is not the opposite of greatness. I think, humi I think hum a lot of people have the wrong idea about humility. Humility is actually essential to greatness. Yes. Truly great people are truly humble people. Amen. Humility does not merely say, I am nothing and I can do nothing. That's, <laughs> that's not humility. Yeah. Humility says what is true about me. Yeah. Is when I see Aaron like the Lord sees Aaron. That's what, that's what humility is. Yeah. It does not think too highly of himself. Humility, it's humility that said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So humility doesn't mean I lie about myself. Oh, I, I can't do that, even though I really can. <laughs> Greatness is a measure of what God puts in you, not who you are. It's what God put in you. It's been several, said several times this weekend that, about this comparison of, of Adam, what Adam and Eve knew about God and what we know. It's, this is not a comparison of man to man. This is a comparison of, of what God has done in the time that we live in as compared to the time that, that Adam lived in. It, Jesus said, he that does, is the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist, even though to that time none was greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus talked about great positions and great people and great revelation. He talked about it. But the point was not that we're smarter than John the Baptist or more dedicated than John the Baptist, that there's been more revealed in our time than, than there was to John, to John the Baptist. So greatness is not a measure of, what a, of who a person is. That's, that's more of what pride is. Pride is a measure of what I am. Pride is concerned about who I am. Pride wants to be seen of men and loves greetings in the marketplace, as Jesus said. But pride really just has two notes to sing, me, 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 and I, I, I. Kind of like it reminds me of Haman, all he could think about. You know, the king asks him a question, he thinks about himself. So, Got to be talking about me. And so he, he tailors his answer to what he wants. You know, oh, here's, here's what I think you ought to do to that man. And he's thinking about what he wants. I want to go through the street, you know, and have somebody in front of me and on the king's. And then he ends up humiliated by his own words. He does it to Mordecai, the man that he hates. <clears throat> so they held their peace. They, would never, they never would have talked about this in Jesus' presence. They held their peace when he asked the question. See, the presence of Jesus clears things up. Amen. And it, it didn't clear up who was going to be the greatest. Mm -hmm. It cleared up that they shouldn't have been disputing. Amen. Their conscience held their mouths shut. They held their peace. So some questions are, are not to be asked, and some questions are not to be answered, at least not answered directly. Some, sometimes when a question is asked, it's like you just, you just leave the question on the table and you redirect things. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you can't answer the question directly. You got to redirect the the uh, discussion in a in another way. But as as it said, answer not a fool according to his folly. And some foolish questions need to be avoided. Now I want to give give thanks for to the Lord for how how these things um, how these things opened unfolded for us that Jesus. They didn't ask Jesus to settle the the dispute. They held they held their peace. So we we need to learn from the from the, the disciples response. So sometimes the Lord will, you'll sense in your spirit, the Lord's asking you a question like this. What, what is it you're thinking about? So we, de we need to learn from this that the Lord is tender. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is patient. 
And and when when you're when you're asked a question like that and exposed like that, hold your peace. Amen. They would have rolled they would have rolled it back and undone it if they could, but they couldn't. They were ashamed of that dispute. Their their silence spoke volumes. They knew that Jesus knew. As soon as he asked, they knew. Now, if they had been discussing who is the greatest in the kingdom, then there wouldn't have been any shame. They wouldn't have held their peace. There were a couple of other questions that were left unanswered. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? People didn't want to answer that question either because their motives were wrong. Here's another question that went unanswered. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of men? Ooh. God can't go either way on that one. <laughs> See, there wasn't, they held their peace. It wasn't a good answer to that, to that question. So abiding with Jesus saves you from a lot of trouble. Amen. Our battle has a lot to do with location. That is, the closer you are to Jesus, then the less access the devil has to you. So I want to leave you with this question or this, uh, this observation, rather. No, no man is going to be able to hold their peace on the day of the Lord. Everyone's going to give an account of themselves. Here, they were ashamed, and they held their peace. They kept their mouth shut. But there's coming a day when we'll stand before his judgment seat, and every mouth's going to open, and you're going to give account of yourself. And so I encourage you to abide in him, and then you'll be glad to give your account.